Kalispera sas. Good evening. I am Dimitra Janakopoulos, the director of the play Blood and Bone. Apopse tha kusume istories apo elno Australi ya ta nyata tus ten lava ke otan proto irthanes ten Australia. So tonight, we'll hear stories from Greek Australians up to their youth when they were in Greece and when they first arrived in Australia. But first, let me introduce you to the writer and producer of the play, Meg McNeena. Hello, I'm Meg McNeena. I'm the writer and producer of Blood and Bone. It's a play about the friendship which grew between Australian and Greek people, which outlasted the battles. And it's inspired by my interviews with three World War II veterans, Ned O'Leary, Jack Gallagher, and Alan Simpson. They were from the 2nd, 7th Battalion. When their boat sank just off of Greece, they told me that when they landed on Crete, they had very little, poor ammunition, no supplies, but they were very grateful to the local people who looked after them so well at great risk to themselves. So this play is about that. And our discussion tonight is about Greek and Australian friendship. Here are some of those stories that Demetra told you about. In the war, I was 12 years old, and uh, when the Germans attacked Crete and occupied Crete, uh, they came with aeroplanes, Germans surrounded the village, killed anyone they met on the road. They killed about three, four of my uncles, burned the village, put the children, women's children on the line and started to shoot them. And our men come down and killed the Germans, about six Germans, they saved most of the uh, children and uh, uh, women's children, they saved them and took them to the mountains. The Germans burned our villages. We had, after the occupation, some of the Australians and New Zealanders, they couldn't escape to the Middle East. They came to my, to my village. I remember though, that New Zealander one day came and gave me two gold sovereigns to buy flour. And I went to buy flour for, for, for mommy to fix us bread. I remember them all. I got bullets in my leg. I got bullets here from the Germans. In one stage, when I was sent from one post to the other, they, they called me to stop. I had letters. I didn't stop. And they shoot me, of course, but I was fly. I was a young boy and fly. And I knew that I had the bullets in the legs, but I felt the heat. But I ran down to the village. They hide me under the house. The Germans came looking for pickle. Pickle, they did gave them food, wine, and they disappear. Where did you hide the letters or the, the special things you had to carry? Swallow them. Swallow them straight away. That's I had that orders in case Germans got me to swallow the letters. A lot of soldiers pass from my village through the White Mountains, waiting the Australian ships and English ships to uh, take them to the Middle East. But uh, because my village is between Suez and Yerumel, it's close. And they pass hundreds and hundreds from my village and help them out of villages, uh, help them uh, to pass through the mountains. Those people, they come a thousand miles away to help us. N most of them, they had no guns. They had no guns because they ran in to escape. They trying to escape. So they fought because the Cretans a welcome, they were open, open arms, because they came in to help them. And they fought together. They fought together with our parents and our grandparents. And we always, we have a friendship. The Cretans, if you go from Australia to Crete, you say you come from Australia, they look after you like one of their own child. Yes, they love them. They love them.
my grandparents, uh, my grandfather fought during the Battle of Crete. Um, I'm born in Australia, obviously, to Cretan migrants, uh, but my grandfather uh, served during the, uh, he actually served in the Balkan War first and then came down to and served during the Battle of Crete as well. What was the role, as you see it, in the Battle of Crete in forging a bond between Australians and Greek people? That bond is something very special and it's very special to me as an Australian um, of Cretan background and that's why um, you know we do the utmost that we can do to promote that bond that were forged on the battlefields of Crete in 1941. Um, that remains today, t t till today. However, I must say that uh, when our veterans were with us, because um, there's only a couple of veterans still with us at the moment, but when our veterans, the majority of them were still with us and they would go back to Crete, I can't, I can't begin to describe the emotions um, that um, uh, would play when they went back to the villages that, um, and they met the families that uh, hid them, fed them, clothed them, housed them, uh, some of which paid the ultimate price, obviously, as Germans came through and realised that Australians were being uh, housed in the, these villages. Uh, don't forget, Australia and Greece were allies in the First World War in Gallipoli too. We were allies in Second World War and continued on to Korea, into Korea, onto Korea. I suppose that played a major role in Australia opening its doors into the mass migration of Greek people coming across. Um, you would have to link the two. Uh, most definitely, I would say that you know that played a major role in the friendship that exists today. And of course, when we saw in 2011 and 12, the second migration period because of the crisis in Greece. We had several thousands of Greek people come over um, and be sponsored, others sponsored, others were born here but had gone back to Greece and so forth. But either way, they made themselves way back. So the, the bonds continue to today. And our role is, is as important as it was for our parents in the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, is as important now to continue that, um, that and to continue highlighting that point. Um, our affiliate organisations commemorate the, the Battle of Crete in a, in a very um, formal and informal manner with uh, co commemorative events, wreath laying ceremonies, um, doxologies, uh, lectures and forums, theatrical plays like this year. I was very uh, honoured to be uh, supporting uh, the theatrical blood and bone, and we did whatever we could to support and and um, basically uh, make sure that it went ahead um, because uh, at the end of the day uh, we do a lot of the standard events but theatrical plays we don't do as often so I found that very interesting I think uh, the story was fantastic um, yeah, there was a few tears I reckon shed throughout the afternoon on, on uh, during the play so um, yeah I think I was and I'm actually quite happy that uh, we, as a federation, as and as a commemorative council, we put our name to it. Of course, uh, if there's opportunity for another staging, absolutely, I, I highly recommend it. I think the 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 roles that were played were fantastic. Uh, didn't need a lot of props, but the message was pretty loud and clear. So we're commemorating at the 80th anniversary at the moment, but uh, if you if you if you go back if you date back to the First World War, it's, yeah, it's over 100 years. Um, I think it'll continue. It's up to us. It's up to my generation to continue it. And I think we're doing a, a not bad job because we've reached out to the families of the, of the Anzac veterans, the families, their grandchildren, their nephews and nieces, sons and daughters, a lot of which came to the play. I saw quite a few at the play, um, which was good. Um, like I said, we do everything we can um, to continue you know, that, that relationship, that bond. I, I reckon this is important to remember so we don't so we, it does get repeated, so we don't go to an, into another another world war. So the history of the past becomes uh, an example for the future. Um, we don't need war, you know. We should have, there should be peace amongst all the nations. Uh, there's always ways of um, working together, and I don't think uh, I hope that there isn't a third world war. to Australia because it was after war and in Greece was very poor, no jobs around. And I've been in love with my husband. He's come to Australia, who was a guide then, and I follow him too. And did you travel alone or with family? 
when I come to Australia by myself, with other girls, of course. We come with aeroplane, and we land in uh, Essendon, and it was about 60 girls altogether. And did you speak any English when you came to Australia, no. and what was that like? Very hard. After one week, I went to supermarket in Clarendon Street to buy something to cook. I get the basket and I saw a lot of uh, cans. And I say, oh, that's very nice. Take one, put, take the other one, put, the other one. Put. An old lady, Australian, she was behind me and she talked to me. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I made because I'm not understand. Anyhow, she's following me. I saw a lady with black clothes, and I said to her, excuse me, are you Greek? In Greek, of course. She said, yes. I said, please, ask this lady what she want of me, because she follow me, and she say something, but I'm not understanding. She asked her, and she said to her, oh, this girl must be very good girl, because she must love a lot the animals. She bought a lot of animal cans. <laughs> I dropped the basket and I ran out of the, of the supermarket. I didn't buy nothing. That's my funniest thing in Australia. But it doesn't take me long to learn English because I used to like to learn. After three or four months, I can understand. What was it like to be a child in Greece in World War II? We was hungry, we was no clothes, no shoes, and uh, very poor. I grow up, not only me, a lot of Greek kids in my age, with a piece of bread with oil and sugar on or salt. That was our breakfast. My father, when he was in the police force, he said to me, to us, of course, uh, when the Greeks make some sabotage, you know what sabotage is, to German, the German go to university, pick up the best boys, students, take them to send up in Thessaloniki's place, we call Castra, because it was Castro there, and they put the policemen to shoot them. And my father, he's not even kill a mirmingi. How call mirmingi? Net. Net. And uh, he's, he didn't go, but his boss loved him. But the third time, he said to him, sorry, Panagioti, I can't uh, excuse anymore. My father got me and my sister, and we went to the village, my mom's village. And we've been over there for up to 47, 46, and 46 we left from there because the communist, how you say, the communist side, they chased my father to kill him because he was uh, for the kings and how, I, I can't understand how to say in English. And we went to his place in the other side of Greece, in Peloponnesos, Mani. And we come back after 1952 again to Macedonia, and we're still there. And did you um, see any soldiers and things like that when you were a child? Yeah, when uh, I was two years old, two, two and a half, in my mom's village, one day I watching from the window and I saw from the other village come a lot of soldiers. And I say, Mom, Mom, come and see how many soldiers. And when my mom saw them, wow, they are German. She called her, she grabbed me and my sister because we were seven in family, but I was the oldest and we was only two then. And uh, she grabbed us and grabbed the blanket, we go to the bush to, live, to sleep. We stay about 15 days there, 15 nights, 15 days. And after the, the mayor of the village come and say, come on to the village, the Italian, was Italian, not German. They promised they're not gonna touch you. And we come back 
And when we come and hold my uncle, he was two, four years older than me, from the hand, and when they saw us, he say, oh, piccola, piccola. Piccola means child. And one of them tried to grab me, to put me in his lap, you call it. I'm going to give you lollies and blah, blah, blah. Tell me a song. Of course, with the interpreter, because I not understand what he say, what he say. And uh, I sit there like this, and uh, because I want to get some lollies. <laughs> and my mom was opposite, and she make to me like this. No, she didn't say no, just move her eyes. Because she knew I'm gonna say the song, Coroido Musulini, Canenas de Tamini, Que si que Italia, que la sesta megalia. That's mean, stupid Mussolini, no one of you gonna survive, you and your Italian. Excuse me, you're Italian? No, I'm, no. Sc- I'm Scottish. <laughs> If <laughs> you're Italian, sorry. That was the war time, and I didn't say the song. But he gave me lollies. You got lollies? Sugar in the cubes. That was the lollies. Um, and what do you think that young people now um, need to know about those times 80 years ago? Well, I don't wish them to, to have time like this, but they got more worse than than before now with coronavirus. I think that's the most worst thing. War time is not very good because you lose people, you lose, you know, a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I don't wish ever again come this. But uh, I remember now and I see the life help, how you say still, Marianne, how cruel is the life? Yeah. I think then was better because we love each other. We care one for the other. I come to Australia, we've been all together, very close, every day parties, every day together, go to Buzuka, go to and Australian people too, I've got a lot of Australian. And I have no one complain about the Australian people. No one tell me nothing bad. Because I hear a lot of Greeks, they say, oh, you know, very bad. I don't have no complain. I landed in Melbourne back in 1959 as a 12-year-old uh, with my parents and my three sisters. Uh, prior to that, uh, my two older brothers were here back in 1953. And they loved what they saw uh, in this uh, beautiful country, in Melbourne of course. So the decision was made that the rest of the family come to Melbourne. You went to school as well? Did you speak any English and how was that being a, a, a Greek kid at school? Living in North Carlton I went to uh, Princess Hill High School, uh, uh, primary school. Um, I have to say uh, things were a bit tough at the beginning. No English at all, not a word. Um, there was a a difficult period uh, where four Aussie kids uh, were picking on me after school every day and I said to myself enough's enough so uh, I made a decision that uh, I will nick off school half an hour before it ended and go home so I didn't have to front up these bullies you know but my mother was a bit suspicious. She never saw any kids in the streets. She says, why are you come so early? I said, Mama said, uh, my period finishes half an hour before uh, the rest of the school. So, so one of my friends, uh, his name, a Jewish boy uh, named Henry Nissen, 
did ask me, Steve, why do you go home earlier than us? I said, look, Henry, uh, I get picked on every day after school by these four young fellas. So I tried to avoid them. He said, tomorrow, wait till the end of the school and I'll be with you. Fair enough, the next day, Henry was with me and he said uh, to the four boys, why are you picking on Steve? Ah, blah, 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 you know, uh, he's a dago, he's a, a wall, you know, things like that. And he warned them, he said, look, you either leave Steve alone or I'll fix you myself. They ignore him. Anyway, Henry, he was learning to be a boxer at the time, did a good job by knocking them all down one by one. And I have to say, that was the end of my bullying from that day. Everything went back to normal the next day. I was ignored, I was avoided, and I was very thankful about that Jewish boy, Henry Nissen. Now, the story hasn't finished there. 20 years later, this young boy, this young Jewish boy, Henry Nissen, became a Victorian boxing champion. And uh, some years later, I uh, saw Henry doing shopping at a Woolworths uh, supermarket in Moorabbin, and I recognised him. I said, Henry, you saved my life. Who are you, he said. I said, listen, you might not remember me, but I haven't forgotten you, and I will never forget you. <laughs> <laughs>
the play relates to young people and the story would relate to young people. My daughter enjoyed it. Um, it was a part of history that we hadn't really discussed. It, uh, I think, offered us an incentive to later have a conversation after the play to discuss history, to discuss what people had gone through. It, I think it was very enriching for us as a mother and daughter to do this, so it was quite a gift. Um, and because there were mothers in the play as well, um, that was also, it was a play about family, it wasn't just about history. History was quite incidental to everything that was going on and it was a fun way for her to see history rather than just watch a documentary or read a book, which is hard for teenagers these days. I'm going to backtrack a bit. I remember when I was a teenager, my daughter's age, I saw um, The Sullivans and it also um, documented history. So for me, um, that was very important in terms of getting me a little bit interested in history and in Greek history and this was the same for my daughter. So your question now is how the performing arts um, help us. I guess they transport us to that time. I felt that I went on a journey to Greece during the war. Um, I also felt at the same time that I could see what was happening in Australia. So I was actually um, transported to that time. Um, I could empathize with the characters. I li lived through this myself. So um, it was definitely very important to take us somewhere else to help us empathize with what people went through. Because sometimes we forget and we don't give our veterans the credit they deserve. Back in 1963, actually, um, uh, my parents decided to become Australian citizens, mainly to get the pension, you know. And my mum said, uh, why don't you come along with us, you know, uh, you can become an Australian citizen. I said, mum, I said, there's no reason for me. Um, you know, you and dad, yes. But uh, anyway, to cut the uh, story short, I did become an Australian citizen in 1963 not knowing that uh, two years later uh, the government the government here made a decision that conscription will start because of the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, back in 1966 I registered for national service and whichever way you look at it, lucky or unlucky, my number came up and uh, I served two years in the Australian Army from 1966 to 1968. Yep. All the training was done successfully and I end up uh, with the 3rd Battalion Royal Australia Regiment. It's an infantry battalion uh, stationed at Woodside and uh, the word came out that 3rd uh, Battalion will be leaving for a tour in Vietnam at the end of 1967. And fair enough, uh, I was one of the 60 soldiers that landed in Vietnam on the 12th of December 1967 as an advance party, get the, get the uh, camp ready for the rest of the uh, battalion to arrive, which they did on Christmas Day uh, in December 1967. What did your parents think of you heading off to war? <laughs> it's emotional. Oh, yeah. I think uh, my mother especially, because she was the one that forced me to, to become an Australian citizen. And she was crying, and like all mothers in war, you know. But uh, touch wood, uh, we returned safely and uh, in one piece. So, uh, yeah, uh, it was a very emotional moment. In actual fact, I never told my mother that I was going to be. <laughs> uh, I told my father, I said, look, you tell her that, uh, you know, when I'm over there, you tell her that uh, I'll return safely. And that was happened. In every war, I think, uh, Mothers, especially, 
traumatized more than uh, the dead. I think that's true. But uh, luckily enough, uh, we return in one piece. And it was a hard Australia to to return to in oh, some ways very with, much so. uh, after the Vietnam War. Meg, uh, the Vietnam War was very unpopular, no question about that. Um, especially when uh, conscripts were losing their lives. I mean, it's not too bad. It's still hard when Korea veterans, uh, soldiers, uh, get killed. But to send young men to war. 20 year olds, 21 year olds, to fight in a, in a very unpopular war back, back then, as we know. Uh, and having some of these conflicts killed, it was very, very tough back home. Greek people obviously supported the Greek campaign more than Australians supported the Vietnam War. What actually happened to Greece in World War II? The Greek campaign started uh, in 1940, uh, 28th of October, when uh, Italy invaded Greece. And of course, the resounding no was given by the Prime Minister Metaxas to the Italian forces that uh, no way the, uh, the Italian forces have a free passage through the Greek soil. And of course, uh, the Greek uh, defence forces were undermined, they were unprepared, but they stood firm and they sent the Italian forces back where they came from. Now, saying that, uh, of course, uh, the Nazis, uh, Hitler, wasn't happy with that, and uh, he sent a very large force to capture Greece, which they did, and eventually all the Allied forces, the Anzacs, the Australians and New Zealanders, end up in Crete early 1941. Now history does say that uh, uh, the Allies were outnumbered by so many German forces uh, and it actually only took 10 days for the German forces to defeat the Allies in the Battle of Crete. Uh, from May the 20th, 1941, till the 30th of May, 1941. Uh, the Australians, the New Zealanders, they fought enormously well. Uh, a great friendship was established with the Greek people, as we know, a lot of sacrifices made by the Greek people to save the Australians and New Zealanders. And in return, we know what's happened. Uh, but certainly the friendship that uh, started uh, back in 1941 or 1940-41 is still, it does still exist right now. It's very important. And why did you and the Hellenic RSL um, agree to support the Blood and Bone project? Meg, it's in our blood. Uh, blood and Bone is based on the events in Greece, in Crete. So for us to support such an event, there wasn't a question about it. Uh, we agreed from the first go, as you know. Um, and we are very proud to be involved plays such as Blood and Bone. Um, great story. It brought back the, um, uh, the friendships that existed then and still goes now between Australia and Australians and Greeks. Um, I think the play was excellent. Uh, to a lot of people that I spoke to after the session ended, they were very impressed. Yeah. And what do you think young people would learn from a story like that or why is it important to share those kind of stories with young people? I think today's young people, without being critical, the life for them here and now is too good. We're back in the war days, life was very tough, very hard. Um, life is hard when there's a war going on. Uh, 
mean, your house, your people, your parents, your siblings are in danger. Uh, and that's why I always say, um, let's hope there won't be any more wars. Um, you know, I think uh, people are more educated now. They've learned the lessons of the past and I'm sure there's a great future worldwide to have.